Welcome to Reader's Advisory 101, brought to you by Library Reads. I'm Rebecca Benook, the Library Reads Executive Director. This program is based on the Reader's Advisory 2019 Unconference Day and features members of the 2019-2020 Library Reads Board of Directors, including Steven Spizzato discussing appeal, Polly Ken on RA Conversations, Andrine Cruz discussing book talking, Greg Windsor on merchandising, Stephanie Anderson with How to Read a Book in Five Minutes, Michael Santangelo on Keeping Up with Books, and Kelly Curry on Book Clubs. One of the essential skills of Reader's Advisory is learning to set aside personal preferences and learn to think more objectively about why individual readers enjoy some books more than others. Understanding appeal is the key to providing good RA service. Appeal captures the elements a reader enjoys about books or that they're seeking from the reading experience. And it provides a common language for readers and library staff to use as they work together to find reading suggestions. There's more than one approach to appeal, but they're pretty similar in what they do. They're designed primarily to think about fiction, but they can be adapted to nonfiction too. Joyce Sarix breaks appeal down into several factors, such as pacing, characterization, storyline, frame or setting, style, and tone. Talking about appeal can provide clues to what readers want. For example, it can be hard to push someone's boundaries if they find security in a particular type of story, but sometimes you can introduce them to a whole different genre if the books share significant appeal factors that they enjoy. Nancy Pearl suggests four doorways of story, character, setting, and language, and suggests that most readers are drawn towards one or two primarily. Every story contains all four of these elements to varying degrees, but the emphasis changes from book to book. Here are two hypothetical books analyzed according to Nancy Pearl's doorways. The book on the left, as you can see, develops all four factors pretty strongly and evenly, whereas the book on the right predominantly develops storyline, though it has a strong concentration on character as well. Now, a reader who isn't interested in rich language or elaborate setting would probably be better served by book B on the right. It's also possible to generalize about genres overall, which can skew toward one appeal factor. For example, in fantasy, usually setting or world building is very important. However, within a genre, appeal still varies. So you might find one that is fast paced versus another that's leisurely. One might be funny versus another that's serious. One might use poetic language versus straightforward language, etc. So it may not be helpful to make assumptions about a genre reader's preferences overall. Catherine Sheldrick Ross has extensively interviewed readers for her research which suggests that we start by asking, what are you in the mood for? This is a search for the right book at the right time. For example, if a reader just finished an intensely sad book, it's possible they may be more in the mood now for something lighter or happier. Other elements, such as the cost and money or time to access a book come into play as well. Now at the library, the books may be free, but time is still a factor. A reader will usually know if they're more in the mood to launch into a big doorstopper or begin a trilogy or even embark on a longer series, or whether they prefer something with a shorter time commitment. Another factor is acclaim. Reading can be a social activity, and one motivation for reading is to experience what other people are buzzing about. Keep in mind that appeal lies in the reader's response to a book. When someone says something is badly written, it may simply mean that that book was written to achieve an effect that they personally dislike, and vice versa for well-written. Here you can see what it looks like when you delve into one of these doorways or appeal factors. Here, for example, take story. As you delve into the various options of story, you can see that they come in all shapes and sizes. 
they may be complex or can be chiefly plot driven. They can feature multiple plot lines. Um, plot twists are an important part of many genres. They can be issue oriented. The experience can be open ended or it can be straightforward overall. So appeal can give you tools to zero in on what readers prefer. Finally, there are steps you can take to better your understanding of appeal. For example, when you engage in personal reading, consider what factors are drawing you into a book or failing to. When you look at book reviews, keep an eye out for those words that signal appeal factors. You can also turn to professional resources such as novelists and other databases and library catalogs. Once you've learned the basics of appeal, you'll be that much better prepared to provide reader-centered service. Hi everybody, my name is Polly Ken. I'm the Reader Services Coordinator for the Lawrence Public Library in Lawrence, Kansas, and I want to talk to you a little bit today about Reader's Advisory Conversations. All right, be honest, how many of you do this when someone says, I'm looking for something good to read? Uh, I think we all do at some time, um, either because every book just flies out of your head or sometimes you're just shocked that someone's approached you with a reader's advisory question. Um, the way to handle this, I believe, is practice makes comfortable. Um, the way to be more comfortable is to be more knowledgeable. I know we can't know everything, but knowing more and being comfortable with appeal factors, um, learning how to keep up with books and genres, learning how to use your tools, practicing how to read a book in five minutes, all of these things you can learn with the Library Reads Reader's Advisory 101 series, and it will help you feel more confident. The important thing to know is there is no such thing as perfect. Um, in Reader's Advisory, there just isn't. So what we do is we smile. We look and listen um, to what our patrons are telling us. First of all, um, approach them. Don't wait for them to ask you. Research shows that only 18% of people even think to talk to, about, talk to librarians about what to read next. Um, they don't want to interrupt us while we're working and they don't realize that our work is helping them find something good to read. So um, make the approach. I know sometimes it's not comfortable, but it's absolutely worth it. Um, ask them, can I help you find something to read today? And then you can follow up after that. Don't, don't settle for, can I help you find anything? That's too generic. And a lot of times people won't pick up that you're asking about books. Um, when you're starting the conversation, Listen for them to talk about appeal factors and words and language to build on. That's going to give you your foundation of the direction of which to go, um, what that patron might be looking for. Um, also, be sure that even if you do panic, you stop, slow down, and ask them questions rather than start suggesting right away. Um, as you know, sometimes the book you read last week and loved might not be the right one for this patron. Um, the other thing that you can do, if that's really helpful, especially if you have it, is use the walk to the stacks or the catalog to further that conversation. Here are some of the follow-up questions that you can ask during your walk. Um, you can ask that patron, can you tell me about a book you've read and enjoyed? That's the most basic question you can ask. And a lot of our patrons are um, heavy readers and this might be an easy question for them to answer. Um, those patrons also might be able to answer the question, which of your favorite authors or series do you wish had a new book? Um, those are questions that help you. You can look in your catalog um, especially if you have a catalog um, that gives you su reading suggestions and um, those might be a little easy to answer. But what about the patron who says, um, I haven't read a book since high school or I'm just trying to get back into reading or I'm in a slump. 
Um, those patrons, are, a great question to ask them are, is what movies or TV shows have you enjoyed? Um, that's a great way to find out kind of, you know, what genres they might be interested in or what things appeal to them. And you can ask those same questions. You know, what appeals to you about those shows? Do you like the characters? Do you like the setting? Do you like the pace? Um, that's a great way to help identify for folks who maybe haven't been reading that much lately. And lastly, asking what are you in the mood for today? It might just be the most important question because sometimes people um, might want to read in the genre they always read in, but they might need something with a little different tone. Um, again, thinking of this as a reading conversation, um, maybe then an in-depth interview might be helpful for you if it makes you nervous to have these conversations. Your goal is to build a relationship with your patron that makes them want to come back and ask you for more. Um, a way to make it feel a little more like a conversation um, is to do things like maybe comment on a book um, somebody's holding, especially if it's something you've read before or you've heard a lot about. That's a real natural way to start up a conversation. And another thing you can do, uh, if the patron seems like they're pretty knowledgeable about a genre, um, ask them for suggestions, turn the tables and see what they suggest to you. Um, it, might not find them the perfect book at that exact moment, but what it will do is start a relationship between you. And lastly, you know, try to send them home with a few books, um, maybe with some multiple appeal factors based on what they told you, um, so you can see if you've maybe um, just sort of cast a little bit of a wide net within um, what they told you they were interested in. And then remember to tell your patrons, if you don't connect with these books, please don't bother finishing them. Life is too short to finish a book that you're not interested in, and it won't hurt my feelings, I promise. Please come back and let me know how I did so I can get better next time. And lastly, um, enthusiasm really is 80% of the battle. It really is okay to have strong opinions um, about a book if you're enthusiastic about it. So, and if you love talking about books, the patron will usually meet you there. The, the one thing I always say though is, if you aren't passionate about a book, or if you didn't like it, those opinions I keep to myself, I might say something like, well, it's not in my area that I usually read, um, but I've heard so many good things about this book from people. Uh, I think that's the safest way to go because then if that person actually loved the book, you don't hurt their feelings. But when you're enthusiastic and when you're positive, uh, it really rubs off on your patrons and they really want to come back and talk to you more about books. And likely if you went to library school, maybe recently, but um, you got some RA training, but when I went to library school, there was hardly any RA training at all. Um, if you didn't go to library school and you're working in libraries, um, uh, this is something that we all just kind of learn on the job. Um, RA Titans aren't born, they're made. Um, you'll need to have these reader's advisory conversations to get better at reader's advisory conversations. So practice makes comfortable. Hi, let's talk about book talking. Book talking is a reader's advisory tool that showcases new books to a big audience in a presentation format. You can do book talking to members of your staff to familiarize them with new books to recommend to patrons, or you can book talk directly to your patrons. So what will you need to do a book talking event? Here are the ingredients. You need one to three staff members. You need 15 to 20 books, depending on how long you want the event to be. You need PowerPoint slides to accompany each book and handouts, which could be your printed slides or a list of the book titles that you talked about with a brief blurb and appeal factors. 
So how long will a typical book talking event be? Plan to spend two minutes max per book. This will give you time to say the title, author, pub date, and a short blurb that includes the appeal factors. Don't rely on the blurb at the back of the book. Try to put your own spin on the description so it's memorable and tailored to your audience. Planning for the event. Book talks are really valuable in highlighting new books to highlight debuts or books that aren't on the bestseller lists, but they're getting a lot of buzz among librarians. Be sure to check out Early Word Galley Chat that happens once a month on Twitter where librarians talk about forthcoming books. You can find more info on earlyword.com. As part of the planning stage, it's important that the books that you'll be talking about can be found in the catalog if you're doing a book talk to patrons so that they can check them out or at least place a hold on them after they attend your event. So the slides should contain at least the following, title, author, book cover, and a catchy blurb. Here's an example of a slide. On this slide, we included a pub date. It's helpful to include the pub date, especially for forthcoming books. Here's another example using a short but catchy description that will entice your patrons to check it out. In preparing your description or annotations, use appeal factors and again, try not to use the blurb from the back of the book. Tailor the wording to your audience. And finally, here's a special note. Do you have to read the book you're book talking? The short answer is yes, preferably you will be able to really craft that memorable annotation and extract the appeal factors easily if you've read the book. If it's not possible, you can rely on reviews from Booklist, Publishers Weekly, or Library Journal to get an idea of what the book is about. Or you can also check out another presentation here at Library Reads on how to read a book in five minutes. Have fun. Hello everyone and welcome to the next chapter of the Library Reads RA101 presentation where we're going to be talking about merchandising displays as Stealth Readers Advisory. My name is Greg Windsor. Not only am I a Library Reads board member, I'm also a reference librarian specializing in Readers Advisory at the Johnson County Library in Overland Park, Kansas. Now before we get started, let's get a few words about my phrasing here, uh, Stealth RA, um, that's not really a thing. Uh, whenever you read around about Reader's Advisory, you'll run into direct versus indirect uh, Reader's Advisory, basically uh, either pitching a book face-to-face -face or doing it by other means. And indirect uh, Reader's Advisory is kind of what we're talking about here. I'm not a big fan of that. Um, if, uh, if Reader's Advisory is a conversation between uh, librarian, staff, and patron, and uh, the displays in your libraries is just another way of holding that conversation. Does not make it any more um, relevant or necessary than a face-to-face -face one, but just a different type of one. So I like to use the word stealth already. So that might not be everywhere, but just to let you know. So let's go ahead and start by defining what a, a display is. Well, my definition of a display is a visual arrangement of different library materials organized by theme, genre, read-alike, topic, or some other different type of connection. The goal of this is to bring materials together from different parts of the collection. This exposes patrons to things they might otherwise overlook. Um, one of the core functions of librarianship, in my view, is that we serve as ambassadors to our collection. Um, we uh, may not, the patron themselves may not know what they want, but we can connect their need to what we have available. And that brings us to the first biggest issue when it comes to libraries, is that patrons often don't know what we have. If you've ever had to give a presentation um, to an outside group and, or to a bunch of students and to describe what the library is and what it can do, 
is almost a completely impossible task. You can't boil it down to like a 30 second, this is who we are and this is what we do. It, we're just too immense. We contain multitudes, right? So that starstruck face of the, of the kitty here kind of tells you sometimes what patrons think about whenever you tell them this is what the library is because most of the people think of the library as rows and rows of books, which we, which we have. But if you're a patron who's looking for something good to read, this right here is pretty much the last thing that you want to see. It's extremely unhelpful. There is no guidance. There's no direction. There's no, um, there's no way to go next from here. You're just, uh, just kind of, uh, you're kind of confronted by this wall of, of resources here. Now, if you know what you want, this is great, right? If you know the book and you know the Dewey Decimal number or you know the Library of Congress number or you know the title and author, if you know where it is, this is fabulous. This is great. But uh, to our normal casual patrons, they may not know what, we, what they want, and this is extremely unhelpful and intimidating, and uh, patrons may not want to, uh, to go any further than this. So this is where displays comes in, right? So first of all, um, everyone at the, your library should be responsible for creating and maintaining displays. Um, you should always make displays accessible and broad enough to easily add to. Um, if you create a display about a hyper-specific um, topic or genre where you only have six items in the collection that fulfill that, if someone starts taking items off the shelf, then you're left with an extremely empty display. So make sure that you can easily add to it and kind of keep it moving and keep it fresh. Also, the displays make it easy to turn over. Um, if, if something's not working, if uh, a, a display is just sitting there for, for several days and no one's taken anything off of it, hey, change it. Give something else a shot. Uh, all of your materials at your library are fighting for eyeballs, they're fighting for relevance of your patrons, and if they're not being used, if they're not, um, if they're not being um, kind of accessed by your patrons, then, you know, listen to what your patrons are not looking at, and then, you know, tr give them, give something else a shot. Remember Ranganathan's first law, um, materials are for use. And your goal of a, of a display is to be is to surprise or delight your patrons. Again, patrons are, don't always know what we have, uh, and they sometimes are surprised by what we do have. So make sure that you get those things, those untold, those dusty corners of your library. Make sure that you put them out there so patrons can get up there and find out what we have. Um, whenever you're doing um, displays at your library, it's always good to do an audit, right? Walk through your branch, walk through your library and make a little map uh, and find out where at your branch, where are your displays? Um, are they concentrated in a certain area? Are they near the front? Are they near the back? Um, um, are, there being, are they being used? Do they make sense to, to be where they are? If you kind of map out your location, find out where your, your spots are, um, it gives you a better control, a better guide of what you have um, in your system, and, what, and more importantly, what your patrons see. If we work in a library for a long period of time, sometimes it's hard to see the library as a patron. We always kind of see it through our own librarian lens. So I encourage people to walk in through the doors of their library. Uh, just like a patron would, to find out, you know, what, what do they first see when they walk through those doors? Um, does it make sense to be there? Is it helpful? You know, and those, let those inform your decisions. Um, let's talk real quick about location. Um, the four best locations for library displays include the entrance that we talked about before, the end of stacks, um, high traffic areas, and the circulation desk. Um, I always like to point to um, scientists who've done like important research on, on, on marketing and advertising and kind of the layout of, uh, of uh, stores. Uh, there's a guy named Paco Underhill who's written several books about this phenomenon. Um, uh, Why We Buy is probably his best known, but he's you know, done massive research on, on why the, the milk and the eggs are in grocery stores the way they are, why you know the gum and the candy is kind of up, up at the checkout counters. It's all for a reason, right? And so if you kind of look, maybe skim some of those things, look at some what those people are telling you, it might inform you of where to put 
your displays in your library. Put some thought into it, not just because, well, there's an empty space here. We need to fill it with something. Um, have some thoughts and some, some insights um, behind it. One of the things you absolutely must have, or at least in my opinion, is staff picks. Now, people like what we like most of the time. If the stereotype of a librarian is um, that we sit around all day long and read, which of course is completely fake, and if you know a job that includes that, please let me know because I would love to do it. Um, make sure that uh, people you can use, take advantage of that stereotype, right? When people walk through the, the doors of the library and come up to a library staff member and ask what they want to read, they see us as book experts, right? So we leverage that. Uh, make a staff picks. Let people know what you and your staff are reading, and people will absolutely be interested in it. Also, um, face out your books whenever possible. Um, publishers of books spend millions of dollars um, for art and design and uh, to kind of make the cover of the book enticing, right? So may have those book publishers do work for you. So if you come across a book with a, an arresting title, maybe something like a, a Ray Bradbury's 451, maybe it's an older title, but it has a, a, a title or a, a cover that has a striking image, you know, with bold colors and a, and a bold design, or maybe um, Exit West by, uh, by Hamid, who that has kind of this, this kind of elegant, but yet kind of uh, arresting cover that immediately makes you want to reach out and grab it, or even just uh, the game plan by Kristen Hall uh, Callahan. You may not know what type of book it is, but it, looking at the cover, you know exactly what type of book this is, right? So you you know what to expect even before you open the the, the book. Again, patrons are going to um, to gravitate toward these images, and uh, it should go without saying. Um, if you do um, a lot of face outs at your library, make sure the books that you, and the materials that you do f use to face out are clean, new, fresh copies. Don't put your dog eared, battered um, cover um, out there for patrons to see. You want uh, things to look nice, slick, and attractive and um, encouraging for patrons to reach out and grab and to take home. And I kind of mentioned this earlier, keep things fresh. If something doesn't work, rotate it out. Um, your library materials that are new, your new releases, make sure to give, make sp spots for them so they're easily accessible. Um, and to give a lot of other people in your library a chance um, to, to make displays. If it's just only one or two people, you're kind of really doing a disservice to your, to your patrons and to your branch. Also, another thing that I'm a big believer in is clean, attractive signage that doesn't assault the senses. Um, maybe a, a common pratfall of libraries is that you come in and you look around and you're completely assaulted by text, right? Um, signs and fonts and uh, colors all kind of uh, fight for attention, and it's easy for them all to be kind of passed over. Your eyes, will be your patrons' eyes will just glaze over, right, and kind of ignore all the big, all these things that are yelling at you. If you make signs for your displays, um, make sure that you don't use very much text, that your text that you use is easily accessible and readable from a, a long distance, and to not cram things in together. Open space, the blank space between signs or between displays or between your shelves actually allows the eye of your patron to rest and it draws attention to the things that are there. So don't cram, make that empty space work for you and kind of make it a clean, um, attractive place to, to browse and to be enjoyed um, by your patrons. Also stealing this idea. Man, librarians love to steal, and uh, we don't call it stealing. We call it borrowing, maybe, or, or, or getting inspired by other people's stuff. But if you either uh, look at other libraries, other branches in your area, or even if you uh, go on Pinterest or uh, Instagram and, and see what other libraries and librarians are out there are doing for their displays, man, take some of those ideas and, and, and import them um, to your own library. This one is, you've seen this one before, you wrap up a, uh, a book in a, gray, in a brown uh, thing and then just kind of put like a little descriptive on the cover and let people to be enticed the mystery of the book, right? At my library, 
one of our children's librarians um, had a leftover bag of googly eyes, you know, that for craft projects. And she went to a um, romance display and put googly eyes on all of the characters on the romance novels, which was hilarious. And things checked out because it draw pe drew people's attention and it made uh, people sit up and take notice. So if you see other libraries out there doing fun and interesting things, make sure to, to borrow those ideas for your library. So you make sure to see how they fit with what you do. And, and I'm also I'm a big believer of diversity, not only um, for authors, you know, I always like to make sure every list that I make or any display that I have uh, uh, includes authors of color, um, LGBTQ+, um, but also diversity of format and genre. So if you just make a display of historical fiction, for example, you're missing a big opportunity to have um, real life um, things from your nonfiction section, things from your biography section, things from your do documentary DVDs and uh, audiobook section. Make sure you have a diversity of formats, authors, and genre, if possible, um, included into your um, displays. Again, drawing, um, drawing from every part of your library that makes sense. Um, putting it in front of your patrons, making patrons know that you know, that uh, we just aren't just books or aren't just DVDs. We have all these other things out there that you may not know about. I always like to make sure that uh, large print, um, for example, is, uh, is uh, represented in some of our displays. And finally, um, displays uh, work on their own by themselves. They're fabulous, but also you can use them to tie into existing programming and initiatives that you have at your library branch. Like for example, if you have an author coming in that say is a young adult fantasy author, um, make sure to have other, um, other uh, young adult fantasy author displays there. So when you have people coming in for that event that you don't just leave them just with that event. So like, oh, here's other things that you might be interested in. Here's some story time. Uh, if you have a lot, to, if your branch is big on story times, make sure there's some sort of like storyteller, um, you know, read aloud um, type of resources available. If you have any sort of other um, programs about maybe financial literacy or resume building, make displays based around those initiatives that you have. So it ties in and reinforces your library um, programs, their initiatives, and, uh, and kind of leaves the patrons with other things in their hand relating to what they came in for, if that makes sense. So use that, um, that display space for marketing and, and uh, mark giving away those resources that we have. And this is just a quick surface scan of what um, some best practices of what you can do um, with your displays. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you, this inspires you to make displays and have a lot of fun. And uh, thank you for your time and hope you enjoy the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Hi, uh, now let's talk about how to read a book in five minutes and why a really valuable reader's advisory skill um, that you can use every day, whether you work behind the scenes at technical services or on desk or wherever you are, learning to read a book in five minutes can really help you up your RA game a little bit at a time every single day. So here's some reasons why it's important to have this skill. First, uh, over a million books were published last year, and over a million books were published the year before that. So um, if you're going to keep up with them at all, or you want to feel like you know a lot about a lot of books, you've got to read some of them in five minutes. You can't give all your time to every single one of them. Two, there's only one you, and three, there are only 24 hours in the day, and you can't spend all 24 of them reading, unfortunately. Um, four, your patrons think you've read every book in the library, um, and so anything you can do to help them keep thinking that is great. And of course, five, you don't actually have to have read a book to help, its find, help it find its reader. The goal of reading a book in five minutes is to give you the information you need to help the book and the reader find each other with your help. Um, so what you're looking for when you read a book in five minutes is all the crucial details you need to figure out what's the context of this book and where does it fit into the larger world of books and readers. So the first step in reading a book in five minutes is to judge its 
judge the book by its cover, which of course, hopefully we all know by now is actually a really, really important part of Reader's Advisory. So uh, you do this differently depending on whether the book is fiction or nonfiction. And here are some of the questions I ask myself when I'm judging the cover of a book while I'm reading it in five minutes. And then we'll look at a couple covers and apply some of these questions. So how does the design indicate the content? So what I mean by that is thinking about, does this book look like other books? Um, is the cover trying to be original or to look like other covers and if it's trying to look like other co covers what other covers is it trying to look like cover designers who work for publishers are really familiar with the different tropes or ideas or design elements that other book covers have and so when they think about designing a book they're really trying to communicate to you the reader or the librarian something about that book so read into that a little bit what design choices have they made that remind you of other books or don't remind you of other books um, look at the cover copy is it trying to lure the reader is it trying to have a cliffhanger to scare them um, who's blurbed the book a blurb is you know that little quote from another author usually um, they want you to look at it and say like oh I've read a book by that author and, and I like that author um, are there any early reviews on the book perhaps from like library journal or publishers weekly has the author written other books that's often indicated on the cover um, this one seems kind of funny unless you spend a lot of time with genre fiction but how large is the author's name often the size of the author's name on the cover can give you a sense for how well the publisher expects you to know the author already. So the more popular an author gets, the more readers they have, the bigger that typeface seems to get because suddenly the most important thing about the book um, and marketing the book is making sure readers know who wrote it. After all, if you have a new book by Stephen King, the most interesting thing about that book to an unsuspecting reader who's just wandering by a bookshelf is, oh, there's a new book by Stephen King. Stephen King readers are not gonna care very much um, what it's about. They're just going to want to read a Stephen King book. And even people who don't read Stephen King will have a sense for what kind of book it probably is. Um, how hefty is the book? Can it commute? Or is it this kind of book you got to keep on your bedside table? Look at the size of the book. Does it go to the beach? Um, and how's the type? Big, small, crammed, white space? Like, Take a look at all these different physical elements of the book. Publishers are very smart and they pay a lot of people. Um, their whole jobs are to make the book look a certain way to attract readers and give readers some hints about the book. Um, so take advantage of that and evaluate that before you even open up the book and look at it too much. So like, look at some of these covers here. Um, you can tell by looking at these covers, there's a couple different things that jump out at you right away. So let's look at the middle cover, for example, for John Sanford's new book, um, Bloody Genius. You can see that John Sanford, I mean, also, it says number one New York Times bestselling author next to his name. So that's an important piece of information. You can see that he's obviously a well-known author because the name, his name is in quite big font at the top. Um, and you can probably guess, even if you don't know who John Sanford is, what kind of a book it is by the elements of blood on the cover. It's obviously part of a series because it says a Virgil Flowers novel. So even if you've never heard of John Sanford, you can take a quick look at this book. And if a patron um, says to you, you know, I love a thriller, I love a mystery, you think I'd like this book, you're seeing some hints even just looking at the outside of the book where you're like, yeah, that could be a good match for you. Um, conversely, look at the book to its left, All This Could Be Yours by Jamie Attenberg. You can see that she's probably a well-known author, but this has got a little more of a literary cover to it, right? It's got sort of uh, a more of a designy type cover with a, a fancy typeface. Um, and you can learn a lot of things about Jamie without even turning the book over. You can see that she's the best-selling author of the Middlesteens. And you can see at the top, there's something from a Kirkus review that says the poet laureate of difficult families. Um, so even though the image on the cover maybe doesn't tell you too much about what type of a book it is, you can guess that like this is more likely to be literary fiction and knowing that she writes about difficult families is also a really helpful element when you're talking to patrons and doing reader's advisory because the idea of a book about a family is something that patrons are asking for all the time. And then on the other side, we have a romance novel uh, by Talia Hibbert. Um, so you can see maybe she's not at this point, uh, although her star is rising quickly in the world, she's probably not yet quite as famous as John Sanford or Jamie Attenberg in the grand scheme of things. So her name is a little smaller um, and they've made the title a lot bigger. You can see, you can tell this is a romance a couple different ways. One is the tagline is love wasn't on her to-do list. Another is that the quote at the top indicates that it's got romantic elements and also Helen Huang is a well-known romance writer. 
So all of those elements together let you know, like this is probably a romantic book, a romantic comedy maybe based on the illustration. Um, so even if you never read any of these books ever and never do anything else with them, now these are three more books you can put in the firmament of your mind and be able to refer to them when you're starting to think about like what's an author that this patron I'm speaking with might like. Or, you know, if you're lucky enough to have the opportunity to do reader's advisory in person, when you see these books on the shelf, you can snag them and be like, oh, this might be a good one for you. Now things are, then, then you want to look on the inside if you've got these five minutes. So you can see that evaluating the cover doesn't actually have to take more than a minute or two. So that leaves you two or three minutes left over to spend a little more time with the guts of the book. So when you're looking at fiction, here are some of the questions you'll ask yourself. You'll say, um, does this book seem like it flows? Does it have a prologue? Does it get right to the action? So you can just flip right to the first page. Read that first page and say, like, how is this book starting off? What, what, what feeling do I get off just the first few paragraphs of this book? You can quickly look at the style, the pace, the language. Um, take a peek and see, like, are there, like, letters? Are there interstitials? What kind of, what kind of format does it seem to be? Um, is it, does the book remind you of anything? That's another question you can ask yourself with all of these different elements um, in terms of how it's laid out, in terms of the cover, uh, all of these different things. Can you connect this book to other books in your mind? And start asking yourself questions. Who is this book for? What is this book for? Um, just based on what you know about other books and where this book fits in contextually. Um, are there book club questions at the end? That can sometimes be a quick cheat way to see what the larger themes of the book might be or learn more about the characters. If you see what the publisher is asking in the book club questions that are often at the end of a novel. Um, and read the author bio, read the acknowledgments. Sometimes that gives you some helpful clues to what, what to expect from this book and the person who wrote it. Um, the other thing I'll mention that uh, was on the previous slide too, is not you're not just looking at how the text is formatted on the outside but also on the inside one of my best tips to give you is that the more white space there is on the pages of a book the faster paced it's likely to be because when you think about the types of book that have lots of white space unless it's like a experimental poetry book or something like that generally you're talking about something that's got very short paragraphs very short bursts of dialogue you're talking about some kind something from one of the adrenaline genres probably something that's a thriller the, the there's lots of cliffhangers, the pace keeps going and going and going. So sometimes when you're talking about looking at the formatting of the book, it's as simple as just opening it up and looking at a few pages and thinking like, are there lots of big, chunky, 20 line paragraphs in here with people talking at each other um, and lots of long observations? Or am I seeing lots of white space where it's like, he said this, she said this, he said this, and then they all jumped off a bridge or something like that. So you don't even have to read too much of the book to start to just pick up a couple more things about the book and be done reading it in five minutes. Minutes. So things are a little different, of course, when you're thinking about nonfiction, because the way nonfiction is marketed and written um, and read is quite different from fiction. There's some overlap, certainly, and I always say uh, there's no such thing as a patron who comes in and says, I only read fiction and I will never read nonfiction. Most patrons are just looking for a good read. Um, but with nonfiction, you have a whole different set of things to consider. And when you're trying to look at the book in five minutes, there's a lot of different ways to pick up clues about whether what you need to know about this book so that you can help connect it to its right reader. So here are some of the things you'd think about looking at a nonfiction cover, and then we'll look at a couple covers. So what do you think the subject is? Um, do the color and the type tell you anything? This is sometimes not as common with nonfiction. Nonfiction covers, um, some of them, particularly not when you're not looking at a biography or memoir, tend to be a little more um, specific in terms of detail. So if you're looking at a history book, like odds are you're looking at some kind of historical photo or painting on the front of it. Um, so take that for granted. Take a look at what picture they've chosen for the front cover and what the subject is. Um, is the author on the front or the flap? So this sometimes works in fiction, <laughs> but it, it also, it mainly works in nonfiction, which is that if the author's on the front of the book, odds are the book is about that author. If they're on the flap, odds are the book is not about that author. So that helps you very quickly decide like, is this book a biography, a memoir, or one of these weird sort of cross genre nonfiction books that come out all the time now where they're like kind of a memoir, but also kind of about something else. Um, just where is the author on the book? That's a quick thing you can judge. What's the subtitle? One of the joys of evaluating nonfiction books in five minutes is that this, if you can't guess what the book is about by the title, you can definitely guess by the subtitle. Um, 
Um, so take a look at the subtitle again, look at blurbs and ask yourself, what are the credentials of the blurbers, particularly for nonfiction? When you see maybe fellow nonfiction authors, that might tell you something different than if you see, you know, four blurbs in a row from people who are the, you know, endowed chair of whatever the heck from this and that university. Um, that might give you a sense for what the anticipated reading level is and, and maybe how niche it is, how much detail or research might go into the book. Has the author written before, gone on TV, been a journalist? You want to see if you recognize their names from something else. Again, how hefty is it? Get a sense for maybe how deep of a dive this nonfiction book is. Um, and then finally, when you're, we're, this is technically not the cover, but we're still kind of judging the package of the book. What's the table of contents like? A lot of times looking just at the titles of the chapters um, can tell you a lot about how the book is set up and what's going to be covered in the book, as well as maybe what's the, the level of writing in the book. And same thing with like chapter headings or epigraphs. Are there little hints in just how the book is formatted that give you a better sense for what to expect from this book and, and what to recommend to a reader? So here are some fall releases that we can sort of test this out on. Um, so take a look at these three different books that are all hotly anticipated nonfiction books for adults. So the first one, The Body by Bill Bryson, um, we can learn a couple things just from looking from the front cover. So the first is that Bill Bryson is probably really well known because his name is almost as big as the title. That's something we learned from the fiction side. He's also a best-selling author. And we can tell this book is about bodies. <laughs> from a lot of different perspectives. We can also tell that it's probably not like a medical textbook um, because the subtitle is A Guide for Occupants. So it's definitely geared towards anybody who has a body. It's written uh, to be uh, something for the general reader as opposed to being more of a niche title. So, uh, and then obviously with Bill Bryson, you may have a lot of patrons who actually already recognize Bill Bryson's name. Um, and so though all of those things together tell us this is probably like a general work of nonfiction and obviously the topic is the human body. Um, How to Do Nothing by Jenny O'Dell, uh, Resisting the Attention Economy. So this is a little different of a book um, and definitely probably one of my favorite books of the year, I should say, too. Um, what's interesting is that this is like a highly stylized cover. So we can tell that and the, the title and the subtitle are actually more of an imperative. There's more of an action behind them as opposed to like, this is a book about something or something else. So how to do nothing is an, an almost an invitation to the reader, particularly set against the background of these beautiful flowers and resisting the attention economy. And what kind of hammers home for me that this book is probably going to be um, trying to convince me of something is the quote, which is this book will change how you see the world. Um, so this is a book that you're probably going to read quite differently from the body which is to say how to do nothing is going to be about more maybe maybe it's more instructional maybe it's more about changing how you live your life and then how to be an anti-racist you can see again that dr kendi is obviously well known because his name is the same size as the the type for the title. He's a National Book Award winning author. That's important to know. And when we talk about like, what's the subject of a book? Is it in the title? Well, it couldn't be more clear here. We're talking about how to be an anti-racist, not even any subtitle. It's very, very clear from the title. So you're going to know right away that you're walking into a serious work um, by a very well-regarded author. Um, and the topic is pretty clear. It's how to be an anti-racist. So Again, these are all books that if you've seen them before, what I'm saying might even seem a little bit obvious, but keep in mind when we're learning about how to read a book in five minutes, this is so you can evaluate a lot of books very quickly. Um, so when you read a book in five minutes and you already know about it, uh, or you've already read it, then in that case, you might think like, well, I'm not really getting anything extra out of this, but you want to apply these skills to books that you've never heard of and never intend to read and might never see again. With nonfiction, when you turn to the inside of the book, um, you can look at a couple, a lot of the same things you do for fiction, but a couple of different things as well. So um, for nonfiction, there's usually a preface or a foreword from the author sort of introducing the larger ideas of the book. So this is the fastest way to read that book in five minutes is just to read a bit of the preface or foreword. You can very quickly decide for yourself, who's the audience? Is this for academics? Is this for a general audience? Is this a specific audience? Like maybe it's just for teachers. Maybe it's just for librarians. That's something you can usually pick up in just a page or two. Um, again, you're checking for style, reading level, how's the information arranged, looking for illustrations and pictures. Of course, I don't think I'm alone in always being the 
person who flips to the middle to see if there's any pictures and just looking at the pictures and captions. Usually pictures are arranged chronologically to when they're referred to in the book. So sometimes just looking at the pictures and their captions can give you a rough sense for what to expect out of the book. Same thing with the index and bibliography. If you if you have one of those books that looks chunky because it's 500 pages long, but then you flip through and you see that the notes, uh, the index and bibliographies and annotated bibliography and everything else starts at page 350, you're talking about a very well-researched book and that tells you something really important about the book. Look, you can also then look at what books are cited or which books are referred to in the book. Um, that gives you a the best chance possible to understand where this book sits in relation to other books for readers. Again, who and what is this book for? Is this for book clubs? Is this for a layperson, for a specialist? Are there citations? Are there footnotes? These are all the things that just give yourself two or three minutes with the inside of the book. Try to notice some of these things. Um, you're not going to be able to notice every single one of these things for every book. For example, a biography or a memoir is likely not to have a super long bibliography. Um, and there may not be illustrations in, you know, some works of political nonfiction. So you're just looking for what you can pick up uh, based on the book. And again, do it very quickly. You can even time yourself, see how much you can pick up in that five minute spam. Hi, everyone. My name is Michael Santangelo, and I'm the Deputy Director for Collection Management at BookOps the technical services collaboration of the New York Public Library and the Bro Brooklyn Public Library in New York City. And today, as part of Reader's Advisory 101, I'm here to talk to you about keeping up with books. And part of my favorite parts of giving this presentation is I actually, uh, more enjoyable to me is to hear what other people use to keep up with books. And obviously, through the years, um, some of the sources listed in this pre presentation are things I learned from other people, other colleagues. Um, so it's certainly not meant to be exhaustive, but just to maybe review some of the basics that are helpful and keeping up with, with books and to kind of introduce some new sites or publications that you might not be using. So just to go over, we're going to look at some of our traditional library media, what some of our library vendors offer, the website Early Word, Novelist, some journals and magazines that might be helpful, all about books or really journals and magazines that are completely devoted to books, some online publications, what our ARC platforms offer, publisher newsletter, and looking at what some of our local presses and our local newspapers may offer. So for library media, I think we are pretty well acquainted with some of the standards like library journal, book lists, Publishers Weekly or Kirkus. Um, typically, we, many of us use these as review sources, um, but I think they also function, if you use some of their other features, as uh, wonderful sources to learn about new books coming out. Uh, I just wanted to highlight Booklist Online, which has different newsletters you can sign up to have delivered to your email. Um, I think certainly, for our purposes, Corner Shelf, uh, where Reader's Advisory meets Collection Development, is key and is very helpful for sort of your everyday reader's advisory work. I think also we shouldn't overlook some of the services that our top library vendors give. Um, I'm talking about Baker and Taylor, Ingram, or Broadart. So if you think of Ingram's iPage or Baker and Taylor's Tiles 360 or Broadart's Bibs, they very much have newsletters you can sign up for to learn about um, new books that are coming out or you can have some of those notification carts sent to you, which will have some new titles already in a cart for you to look through. Even if you're not um, ordering for the library that you work for, it still might be useful to you. maybe take a look at a notification cart. So just to pull up, here's um, a page from Title Source 360, where you can look at some lists that they have on the site. Um, when you have time, so you can look at and see uh, what are some recent Kirkus reviews and, or what are some current bestsellers or adult books coming out, uh, Spanish and bilingual materials. Um, find it very helpful. And unlike a, maybe getting an email newsletter or reading a publication, you could just go into Tiles 360 when you want and just take a look at some of these lists. A site that we shouldn't really overlook and I think which is been very important to Library Reads work is Early Word, the Publisher Library Connection. Um, it does a lot of work um, to kind of keep up on 
um, what's coming out, um, some developments in publishing, as well as what's going around the literary world when it comes to articles or blog posts or tweets or, or matters like that. What's really important is to take, if you're interested, is to look at the galley chats. These happen on a monthly basis. And basically by Twitter, um, colleagues get together and tweet about current galleys they are reading. It's really a great way to see what your colleagues around the country are reading and kind of keep up on some of that new material. As well, I'd like to just highlight on the right side, you'll see under diversities, upcoming diversity titles. Uh, I found this very useful um, to kind of expand your reading, um, to catch up on some other books that you uh, may have missed in some of our more mainstream publications. Um, last, next, we'd like to just look at Novelist. Um, it is being presented in another part of this section, but Novelist not only is great for finding current recommendations, but also for keeping up on new material. Um, if you go into Novelist, you can check out one of their blog posts on keeping up with new and forthcoming books, and they kind of tell you how to use the product to see what's just come out and which Really, when you're looking under specific genres or types, uh, you'll be fine to see what's the new and the best. As well, we shouldn't forget about the crash courses that Library Reads partners with novels to present, um, crash course in horror or crash course in romance. Um, we work very hard to make sure that new titles are put into these crash courses for our audience. Of course, there is the typical and uh, traditional and true journals and magazines that many of us read. Um, some of the ones I think are great for books are always The New Yorker, The New York Times Books Review, um, The Wall Street Journal, The Guardian. Um, and then I included People in Entertainment Weekly. I think a few People in Entertainment Weekly, uh, what's great is that they really push towards some very popular material. And this could help you see what um, many of your patrons may have found out about, if, especially if they're readers or people or Entertainment Weekly. And here on All About Books, I just wanted to highlight some of the publications that are completely devoted to literature, to books. I think sometimes they get overlooked, but I still read them and, and find them very helpful in my work. <clears throat> so of course we may know the New York Review of Books or the London Review of Books, um, which very much sort of look at the more higher literary titles, um, some academic press materials, um, and find it very helpful if you're trying to really create that well-rounded collection. Um, then I also put um, poets and writers because I, I think, first of all, poetry is often neglected. Um, and I think that it does a great job of highlighting some contemporary poets um, that don't always get the kind of coverage in other sources devoted to books and literature. World Literature Today, um, I really enjoy. Um, I think that it really helps you to um, stay up on literature around the world, as it says, literature in translation, um, and translation, and not just in, in the typical uh, Europe, European um, kind of translations, but with translations from all around the world that we often miss, or, or even uh, books written in English from, from around the world that we don't always get to see. Lastly, I put up Bookmarks. Bookmarks is a really wonderful magazine, and, and not only in print, but also their site. And I, I think what's really strong about their site is they do have a review database that you can use and kind of look up see different books and if you're really looking for books that are well reviewed um, to highlight at your library or such um, it's uh, really a great source and lastly and not uh, is book forum which maybe many of your patrons are reading um, I enjoy it I think it it's a, a interesting mix of talking about new books what's happening in literature as well as um, some really insightful and um, useful essays. Also our online publications um, are more than helpful and these can be blog posts, websites, um, email newsletters. Uh, I think of NPR books. I always have that uh, newsletter, um, email newsletter sent to my inbox and found it 
really kind of helpful, especially since many patrons are are NPR listeners or just as as titles are being discussed around, it helps you kind of focus on what maybe people are talking right at the moment about. There's also BBC books. Um, of course, um, probably many of the people listening to this presentation are right here in the US, but I find that on the BBC website, um, their culture section, the book section is very helpful. And also just has a very interesting content about writers, um, profiles of writers, but also just some latest connection to the latest books being um, published and how they're being received. I don't think this section would be complete without talking about Literary Hub and Book Riot, um, two wonderful sites um, that have really wonderful posts about um, everything from knowing what's the great books of fall to looking at some controversies in literature, um, as well as just helpful guidance about um, where to find good books or where to look for them. Then we have QBR, the Black Book Review, which um, if you know was a kind of merger of two important sources dedicated to African-American literature, um, Black Issues Magazine and uh, the QBR. It's really a wonderful site. Um, it's really well organized and easy to use. And I found it very helpful um, when trying to uh, create um, book lists and especially when you wanna kind of capture um, books that are new, um, but um, are not getting the circulation that you, you think they should have. And, and that's why you're including them on a book list. And lastly, on, on this page, I, I have shelf awareness, um, which is that push uh, email that you can get into your inbox. And I've been getting it for years and years and years. And uh, usually it was created for bookstores, but I think many librarians started sh uh, signing up for the newsletter. And I certainly think they've incorporated us into their message. Um, they will have book reviews. They will have um, interviews with authors of interviews with literary agents and editors and bookstore owners and uh, even librarians will be interviewed on shelf awareness. Don't forget about our advanced reader copy platforms like Edelweiss and NetGalley which are really helpful also keeping up by seeing what new galleys are being offered which of course will help you see what books are coming out soon. Publisher newsletters um, are very good as well. Uh, I, some of the, all the major publishers have these newsletters. Some of them have multiple newsletters. Library Love Fast from HarperCollins. You have Simon Schuster and Soho and Melville House um, has a very interesting uh, newsletter as well. And um, it's a mix of talking about their backlist and front list. Um, some author content and videos, um, and just helps you just kind of keep up what's going on. So often, I think that some of our best book sources really kind of stick to more literary fiction, more general nonfiction. Um, but, and especially if you were not such a devoted reader of genre, you might feel sometimes at loss to know best and newest titles that are coming out. So I just uh, asked around, um, some of these are already new and I use personally, but I asked around some of my colleagues and they kind of shared some good sites that they use to keep up on genres. So for horror, RA for All has a horror section and it's, it's really, uh, really quite good. And as someone who is not a big horror reader, uh, it really helped me to look at some of the newer material coming out and kind of, uh, acquaint myself with some of the newer horror writers. Um, something that I didn't, I really felt that I wasn't picking up from more mainstream publications. For romance, a site I've been reading for many, many years now, Smart Bitches, Trashy Books, um, All the Romance, None of the Bullshit, I think is a quite wonderful site. And I don't know that I could have ever talked to patrons or colleagues about romance without this very helpful resource. For mysteries, um, uh, especially if one wants to go deeper than just the kind of standard police procedurals that we see 
on our top best-selling charts. Um, and, and after we may be uh, often getting our, our email newsletters from Soho Press or Severin House or these kind of very de- publishers very devoted to mysteries, um, I think a site like Stop, You're Killing Me is more than helpful. I think that, especially if you look on the left side, they're they kind of just telling you some of those new editions, new hardcovers, new paperbacks, new large print, new audio. It's um, favorite debuts, um, just really helpful. Um, they break down the mystery into its own genres. They look at diversity. The, um, all those indexes on the side, you can you can look for new new mysteries by location. Um, maybe especially if you're you're looking to um, promote some local or within a general geographic area of your library to your patrons, this is a great site to use. And science fiction and fantasy, I think Worlds Without End is certainly one of the best. Um, It's a blog and it really just kind of keeps you up to date on all things science fiction and fantasy. Um, Once again, just like Horror for All, I really felt that this, more than any mainstream publications, really helped me kind of keep up on what was happening in science fiction and fantasy. I also always try to remind people to really keep up on what's happening locally when it comes to Reader's Advisory. And this is whether you're looking at your local press, whether you're looking at local publishers, or whether you're kind of connecting to those local book festivals. Um, At the time when I originally was writing this presentation, um, I was presenting out in Southern California, and I decided to kind of concentrate on what was happening locally to Los Angeles. And of course, really to know kind of the, what many of your patrons if, would be looking for if you maybe were in Los Angeles would be Los Angeles Review of Books or the LA Weekly or the Los Angeles Times. Um, and then if you look at some of the local publishers, many of who have also have email newsletters kind of keeping up on kind of their new, new books, um, I found This page um, had quite some interesting uh, local publishers who had really award-winning and wonderful books like Red Hen Press or Prospect Park Books or Rare Bird or Unnamed Press or Angel City Press. Um, Definitely another way to keep up on what's new from your local publishers. Hello, this is Kelly Curry, the director of the Delphi Public Library in Delphi, Indiana. And I'm here to just talk to you briefly about book clubs as reader's advisory tools. First, I thought I would just talk about the fact that a book club is the most basic sort of reader's advisory. Um, It's valuable in that you can invite people who love books into a social setting and they're unwittingly, but not unwillingly, receiving RA advice. To illustrate, I'll first talk about how one particular book club evolved at my library. At the Delphi Public Library, we started a book club in 1997. Patron surveys indicated interest, but uncertainty of how this might work. So we began by inviting a guest speaker each month who essentially did a book talk. They chose a book and came and talked about it. Some folks read the book ahead of time, some didn't, not a lot of detailed discussion. So I tried to think about some pros and cons for a reader's advisory in this kind of model. It could be good in that the guest speaker may suggest something that you've not read nor have in your collection um, and gives you an opportunity to to increase your collection development skills and support excellent um, RA services and new read like and display opportunities too. But on the other hand, the guest speaker may want to read something and discuss something that you haven't really chosen for your collection for reasons, uh, a a myriad of reasons. It's difficult for a guest speaker and outsider to know the culture of your community and patrons, so they may not choose the best books for your, for your group or your reader's advisory. So after a few years, our book club members who regularly attended began suggesting books they thought would be good choices for discussion. So we kind of evolved into using a sign-up sheet and each month a different individual was responsible for choosing the book and leading the discussion. Um, so then we began to see a lot more in-depth discussion about the titles. We, we, were, we felt more invested in it. Um, so that gave, again, more opportunities for readers advisory. 
um, and the individual members who were responsible for leading would consult with library staff frequently and, and get support in researching the book or the author. So there were a lot of one-on-one -on -one reader's advisory conversations going on. Um, the bad thing was some members are shy about leading a discussion, so they're not really receptive to it and they don't really want to hear about uh, reader's advisory. So then we moved into phase three, what I call phase three. After another few years with only a handful of attendees willing to take on the role of discussion leader, but a lot of regular attendees who were faithfully coming and wanted it to continue, um, the group asked the librarian to take over and be responsible for choosing the books and leading the discussion. So now the library staff person selects a year's worth of books, releases the list ahead of time and leads the discussion each month. The discussions are uh, are very lively, whether they like or don't like the book, but they continue to ask the staff person to, to uh, choose the books for them. So, you know, this gives the opportunity for the librarian to plan a year in advance. We can purchase extra copies if we want to. We can plan those read-alikes and reader's advisory opportunities. More discussion at the meetings gives us even more opportunities for RA conversations. And, you know, the librarian can be intentional about choosing books that not only offer great discussion points, but also multiple read-alikes. I can't think of any cons for doing it this way, um, because I guess I'm inside, inside it and see how well it works, but maybe you can think of things that, that you might want to think about before you choose this method of, of uh, doing your book clubs. So the moral of this story is there's more than one way to run a book club and certainly more than one way to use book clubs as readers advisory tools. Some book clubs are designed to focus on a theme each month and everyone reads a book within that theme. They may or may not be reading the same books so everyone can share and talk about how their book fits the theme. Um, in theory, this gives each participant a list of good books each month. You know, if you have a, um, if you have a group of 10 people, you're, you, you may get 10 different books each uh, month on, on the particular theme. So that opens up a lot of opportunities for discussions about what other items uh, might be good. So library reads is always a popular um, theme around my library. We, we usually post all the lists and do displays every month. So it, it seems natural to do a book club focused on library reads. You could read the top picks or you know go through the um, the, the large archive we have and find titles in all different kinds of genres and um, types of, of books um, to use in your book clubs. Page to screen is a really popular one at a lot of libraries I know and YA novels seem to be particularly um, popular for for turning into film so you, you'll find a lot of, of mix of good good books that, that might fit well into this theme and give you more opportunities for not only programming, maybe show the movie and read, uh, read the book, but um, more readers advisory opportunities too. Social justice themed book clubs there, you know, you, you'll find a wealth of, of topics can be covered in this kind of a theme and what, what great discussions could be evoked in your, in your book clubs and kind of lead to more readers advisory opportunities if if they're hungry for more. Biographies, memoirs, um, at our book club, we try to read at least one of those every year. Um, and they've proven to be very popular. And, um, you know, it's a large section of our collection. So there's lots of opportunities for people to find just the right uh, biography for them if you want to just do a themed um, biography book club. So other book clubs may allow nominations to be submitted by the members and the entire group votes on the list of books to be discussed. I think this is a great way of doing it. Um, this means that each participant is hearing about other books in addition to those that end up on the final list. So, you know, you could even keep records of all of the nominations and, and do displays on that, you know, almost made the book club or things like that. So lots of more readers advisory opportunities. So now let's talk about some simple ways that you can add readers advisory to your book club in your library. Um, you can list read likes uh, for your book club monthly selections in brochures and posters and any kind of mailings that you do. 
um, just try to squeeze in some read alikes. You can create special displays in the library that include monthly book club read alikes. Um, you could display book, book club brochures and current selections in a special display area and allow all library patrons, not even not just book club members, to check out the book club selections. You know, you might even uh, identify new patrons who might be interested in joining the club if you let everyone check out the books. And it, again, increases, some, increases your reader's advisory opportunities. Um, talk about read likes during the book club discussion, especially if members loved the book. Um, many reading group questions you find online list other similar titles and read likes, so make sure to include those. Post pictures of your special book club display on social media. Um, these, this is just an example of how we've created a template for some book club titles and, and read likes for them. You can do this for all themes too. It doesn't just have to be your book club titles. This is a fun way of, of doing some collection development online. If you have a general book club at your library and you choose the titles, strive to um, include a wide range of, of types of books. Um, for example, some classics, some nonfiction, some YA. Um, that's going to broaden your reader's advisory reach even further. And, and, you know, we're always very excited about all the new titles that get a lot of attention, but you might deliberately choose some backlist titles too to encourage more exploration of not just the new books and get people browsing in your library, not just focusing on the new, new book section. What makes a good book club selection? Lots of things, but I'm going to focus on just um, a couple. One is a, a meaty theme, you know, that it, it, it even if it is a, a fiction book, it may be speaking to a, a specific social issue, and those always provide really good discussions, um, whether the, you know, all of your members agree on the topic or not. Some, some of the examples on that, I should say, that we've used in our library are things about transgender issues, um, immigration, coming of age, historical periods and war, um, different kinds of civil rights and women's rights and things like that. Um, somehow presenting these really tough issues in fiction um, makes people uh, relate to it better in our experience. And discussable characters is always a good, good, um, good rule to follow too. Characters that have interesting jobs, for example. And timely topics, this kind of relates a little bit to some of the themed book clubs we had, but, um, you know, things are in the news and people are talking about it, you know, extend that to your book club and have, give them the opportunity to have that, um, you know, bring that bigger discussion back to your smaller group in your library over literature, which is always a good thing. And that's all I have. I asked you um, to, um, Share your ideas with us and happy reading. Thank you for participating in Reader's Advisory 101. For more information on library reads, including links to other programming, please visit our website at www.libraryreads.org. You can also email us at any time for more information.